Hebrews chapter 4. Let's begin. Therefore, Paul writes, we should fear, lest perhaps a promise being open to enter into his rest, that's the kingdom, any of you might seem to come short. What did Jesus say? Many are called to this kingdom. Few are chosen. So he says, fear here comes short to what? The last trump. When does that happen? On Pentecost. Now, this reminds us of something, doesn't it? Matthew 25, Jesus gave a parable about the ten virgins. They all had vessels. They all had lamps. Five virgins decided not to buy their oil. That's the Holy Spirit. So when it came time, the bridegroom came, they didn't have oil, did they? And you know what it says to the five virgins? The door was shut. Did they come up short? They came up short. They didn't endure, did they? Who is the door? John 10, that's Jesus Christ. And what did Jesus say? He says, those that believe, they will go through the door and be saved. Didn't he say that? So those five virgins that were lazy, let things slip away, weren't on fire for the truth. They lost their first love. They looked back onto Egypt. They let it slip away and they didn't enter, did they? So now let's go to Matthew 24, the Sermon on the Mount. He was speaking to the apostles. It's prophecy. So it's talking about the end time. Let's read verse 9. Then shall they deliver you up to affliction. What, we need, we're going to get affliction? I thought everything's honky-dory. Fun and exciting. Everything's perfect. Jesus suffered, brethren. It says, and shall kill you. And you shall be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Nations have, some of them have billions of people in it. Billions hating you. And then shall many be led into sin. This is the brethren. Because they're hated and not loved by the world, they're led into sin. And shall betray one another. Betray their own, their own in the church. And shall hate one another. Not love one another, like Jesus says. And many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many because they don't have Christ shining in them. And because lawlessness shall be multiplied, the love of many shall grow cold. That's the church. But the one who endures to the end, that one shall be saved. That one shall go through the door. The one who endures to the end. Now, when you couple that with James chapter 1, let's go there, verse 12. Blessed is the man who endures, what? Trials. What are trials? Things that are difficult. Blessed, what, what's the blessing? Because after he has been proved, he shall receive a crown of life. That's eternal life, brethren. A crown for a king who will have a throne in God's kingdom. All because of what? They endured to the end, allowing God to what? Prove. It says, because they were proved. God the Father now can trust you, that individual that endured, like Moses, to the end, to give him a crown of life to rule in his kingdom. Can he just do that to anyone now? How about the five virgins that were lazy? Can he trust them? Were they proved? They failed, brethren. These are real scriptures. And don't be fooled that you, no, that's not me. That's not me. Who said that? Peter, right? The Garden of Gethsemane, afterwards, Peter says, I won't deny you, Lord. He says, before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. No, I won't, he said. No, I won't. And then all the other apostles said the same thing. Did you know that? And they all denied him. So don't get comfortable. Don't seek the things of this world. Because when trials come, who will you embrace? The world. 
So God tells us, let's go back to Hebrews 4, do not come up short to the greatest calling that anyone has ever had, the first fruits. Verse 2, for truly we have had the gospel preached to us. That's the good news. Even as they also did. You know who they are? That's the ones in the wilderness. Now what happened? They went to a promised land. That was good news. A promised land, right? That was a type. Now what happened? But the preaching of the word did not profit them. Did it profit the five virgins that were lazy? No. It says because it was not mixed with faith in those who heard. There's a key note. You have to mix your beliefs, Peter, at that time, apostles, with faith. I do believe that this is temporary, this world in which we live in. I believe that this world hates God. But God's kingdom is prepared for us. You have faith in that. And what is faith? Faith, a lot of people get the first part right in Hebrews 11, 1, but not the second part. Faith is the substance of things not yet seen. I believe in it. But then the next part says, and the conviction of it. I will show you my faith, James says, by what? My works. I gather oil. That door will be open to me because God promises. And I will obtain that crown of life. So stay focused, brethren, and endure. Now the good news is we can get back up. If we're failing... If we're falling away, be sober and wake up and you have a new day and a new Sabbath to look forward to. That's why we gather here today. Let's continue in this wonderful chapter. Verse 3, for we who have believed, we ourselves are entering into the rest. The rest represents the kingdom. The Sabbath rest is a temporary example of that kingdom. That's why we don't forsake it. Those that forsake the assembly of the gathering don't want the kingdom. They show it in a thermometer every week. See? That's why we get up and we come because we want to be with those that are fellow-minded. And so it says, as he has said, so I swore in my wrath. That's God. If they shall enter into my rest. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. So before he made ancient Israel back there, going to a physical promised land, he had it all worked out in a plan on blueprints that the promised land would be the kingdom. See, who made it into the physical promised land? Who brought him there? It was Joshua. And only Caleb and then the new generation made it. The rest did not make it. That's an example of how difficult the way is. The narrow path and broad is the way that many shall go. That lead on to what? Destruction. They even have songs about this. I'm on the highway to hell. Now, would they really sing that if they were at the end of that road? No, because they would be scared and frightened but it's too late. When those five virgins came to the door, let me in, it was too late. God wants to know, will you follow him now? That way you're proved. Verse four, for God spoke in a certain place about the seventh day, there it is, the Sabbath in this manner, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. That was a type, the kingdom's coming mankind. Adam, keep the Sabbath. I made it holy. There's a kingdom that is holy. We have verse 5. And again concerning this, if they shall enter my rest. If they shall. Now last chapter talked about this, the rest. Let's go to Psalm 95. You can title it the Sabbath Psalm. Verse 1. O oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock. Who's the rock? Jesus. Jesus Christ of our salvation. Let us come before his presence. Is he right here now? He's holy. This is holy time. So we all gather. 
And it says, with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise to him with psalms. That's why we have hymns. We sing with joy about his kingdom. For the Lord is great God and a great king above all gods. That's the Father. Jesus Christ is king of kings. The Father is the great king. And you can look it up. In his hand are the depths of the earth. Remember, earth is his footstool. The peaks of the mountains are also his. So the peaks of governments are his. The sea is his. That's the people. And he made it. And his hands formed the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Come, gather. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. For he is our God and we are his people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you would but hearken to his voice. Do you listen to these words? Harden not your heart as in the rebellion. Now, that was last chapter. One that hardens their heart doesn't allow who in? Jesus Christ. And that's what they did in the wilderness. As in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me. Remember, Satan tempted God in the wilderness when Jesus fasted. For 40 years, I was grieved with that generation. So now you know a generation's 40 years. And said, it is a people who go astray. Where? In their hearts. And they have not known my ways, to whom I swore in my wrath that they should not enter into my kingdom. So if you want to know how not to enter God's kingdom, you do exactly what those that look back to Egypt. They served themselves, didn't they, brother and sisters? Do not serve yourselves. Serve the great God. So Jesus gave an example. Who did he serve? He did the will of his father. Everything he spoke was the kingdom of God is likened unto this. He had fixated on the kingdom. His walk was mixed with faith, wasn't it? Every step. He was the most focused. He was perfect, brethren. That's why we look towards Jesus Christ. Now let's go back to Hebrews 4. Remember what Hebrews means. It's those that are from beyond. Our citizenship is not of this earth, but we have to be in the world, but not be a part of it. So we are spiritual Hebrews. And in Hebrews 4, we continue and march forward. Verse 6, Consequently, since it remains for some to enter into it, notice some, and those who had previously heard the gospel did not enter in, and it tells you why, because of disobedience. Children, if they disobey their parents, they're not following the laws of the parents. So we, likewise, need to follow the love of God. How do we know we love God? The scripture says, if we keep his commandments, we do his will. Do you remember it says, obey my voice? I like that because that's action. It's not, I, I believe, I know it's true, but do you follow it? Do you obey, brethren? Verse 7 again, he marks out a certain day, today saying, in David after so long a time, exactly as it has been quoted above, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. So those that don't listen to the words of God, because they don't have time to study. You don't have time to fast. You don't have time to pray. You don't have time for God. Well, then you are hardening your heart to be in your own way. So we don't want that. We want to open our heart to the ways of God and learn how to be productive in a godly manner. Verse 8 for if Joshua, remember he brought him in to the promised land, had given them rest, he would not have spoken long after of another day. See, if Joshua brought him into the promised land and everything was about that promised land over, what, 4,000 years ago or so, then, then it would be finished. 
That was just a mere type, a physical type. We have to go onward because there's a kingdom coming. So there is still remains a rest, a Sabbath for God's people to look forward to. So what should we do on the Sabbath? We should speak about those things to come. Remember Colossians 2, verse 17, I believe. It says, the feast of God, the ways of God, are a foreshadow of things to come. So we keep the Sabbath because it tells you the kingdom is coming. And we're one more Sabbath closer to that destiny. That's what the five good virgins did. Every day they looked up and they smiled. They marched forward with their fellow virgins. See? And they had positive, they had hope. They mixed their walk with faith, didn't they? And that's what we should do. So, if you know more and more about God's laws by keeping them, you will see what's behind that shadow or what's making that shadow. Right now we see through a glass darkly. You ever make that connection? That's the shadow. See, that is a great illustration of a simulation. We are in the shadow, the type, the model. It will all fade away. Jesus said, heaven and earth shall pass, but his words will endure forever. Let's read now verse 9. There remains therefore a Sabbath keeping for the people of God. So don't listen to those that have hardened hearts and they stay at home. So we listen to God and not man. And we read verse 10. For the one who has entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his works, just as God did from his own works. So you have six days to do your work. Not the seventh day. That's why it's a thermometer. If you are on this day, not thinking kingdom thoughts, but talking about your work, your job, your own ambition, the things of the world, that's a thermometer that you're not fixated on the kingdom and you will end up behind. Left in a tribulation and perhaps, as Jesus said, to gather the tares, to throw them into the lake of fire. And that we don't want, brethren. Verse 11. We should be diligent, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest anyone fall after the same example of disobedience. You ever met a diligent person? Was Jesus diligent? Focused? So where is your treasure? Is it in the kingdom? Then we can be diligent to pursue those things. So, verse 12 is one of the most famous verses in Hebrews. For the word of God is living, it's not dead, and powerful. Do you want power? Who doesn't seek power? What, do you want to be weak? If you said, no, I don't seek power, what, do you want to be a weakling? Why do people go to the gym? To become their muscles more powerful. What do they want to be weak? Who wants to be weak? The key is having the power of God. Not the power of Satan the devil, who's a mighty, powerful dragon. But the power of God. Now listen to this. It says, and sharper than any two-edged sword. So you can take one of those samurai swords. They have swords that can cut literally through this table. They're so sharp. But this is sharper, the word of God. Piercing even the dividing asunder of both soul and spirit. And of both the joints and the marrow. It's even physical. Now, blood is produced even in the marrow. So it can even cut deep into someone's, not only their soul, but into their morrow, and is able to discern the thoughts and intents of the heart. So you want to know more about how we work? What's behind a motive? You read, let's start with the Proverbs, the wisdom of God who was given to Solomon. And you could start to understand God can read the heart. Why? Because he is the word. 
Isn't that amazing? That God could just read the thoughts of men? Jesus did. He read the intents of their hearts many times in the Bible. See, so if we don't have time to read God's word, then we are depending on our own thoughts, our own wisdom to discern. See? So we want to put on the righteousness of God. His sword we want to have. With that, let's go to Matthew 22. Now they were trying to trick Jesus. And what if a man had seven brothers when they're in the resurrection? Who gets the wife and all this? They're trying to trap him. Okay, Jesus responded in verse 29 and answered and said to them, You do err. You're wrong. That's what error means. Not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. Did you just notice that? The scriptures are the word of God, so they didn't study, they didn't know them, nor the power of God. Otherwise, they would have known the answer. How many times have you been given answers of God by knowing his word? It's very easy. Those that isolate themselves, Proverbs 18, verse 1, Ask anyone with, on the streets with a, with a microphone, and, you know, I'm on a YouTube stream. What happens when you isolate? You know, you go, you're a loner. What's the result of that? You interview 100 people. Are you going to get all the same answers? No, you're probably going to get 60, 70 different answers. Oh, I think it's actually good for people to spend time alone and, and all this. They're going to have all kinds of different answers. So... That's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. See? And we'll debate those answers and everything. But why not look to God? And it says in Proverbs 18, 1, He who isolates himself seeks his own desire. That's why they're all alone. Because they're doing what they want. That's just one proverb. Okay? There's over 3,000 of them. You want to know truth? You don't want God to say you err. You don't know the power of scripture. That's why that sword can go in because you hit, you hit them with the, the truth and the truth will set you free. And they might not like it, the word of God. And that's what Jesus did, didn't he? They were speechless sometimes. They were amazed with the word of God. They wanted him to pay taxes and he goes, give me a coin. He goes, who's on this coin? Caesar. Well then, give on to Caesar what's Caesar's and give on to God what's God's. It says they were amazed by that answer. And don't say, oh, I would have came up with that one. That's why we have scripture and that's why we need to quote it and know it and live it and be focused as ambassadors. We're an extension of God. In his kingdom, we will be married to the word. Lastly, let's go to Proverbs 27, 17 says, As iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend. Now, what's a better time than right now when we gather for the Sabbath day, which pictures what, brethren? Say it. The kingdom. The kingdom. We sharpen each other with the word of God here. If we become dull in an area, we can be sharpened by it. And that's what makes stronger friends. Remember what Jesus said to him? He, to his disciples, he says, you are no longer my servants, but my friends. A king doesn't share the deep thoughts to a servant, but to a friend. And that's how we should be. We should be friends. But now you know how. Iron sharpen iron because we are friends of God. So let's finish Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13. And there is not a created thing that is not manifested in his sight. He's created all things. But all things are naked and lay bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Did you know not one word that you've spoken? They're all recorded. You won't get away with an idle word. When you're judged, everything is brought to the table. Everything. Which is another sign of a simulation. All being recorded, brethren. 
Let's continue in verse 14. Having therefore a great high priest who has passed into the heavens. Isn't that glorious? Jesus, the Son of God, we should hold fast the confession of our faith. Hold fast to what we believe, brethren. Isn't that what this theme of, of it's talking about when it first opened? Those that come up short didn't hold fast. That's why many fall. As a preacher of the Lord, I constantly am warning brethren. And you know what? It's not my idea. It's all right here. It's constant warnings in the Bible because man is fluff fluff. Man doesn't like warnings. The Bible's full of warnings. Don't get down on a message like this. Rather look up and count it as joy because you know now. 15, for we do not have a high priest who cannot empathize with our weaknesses. No one was beaten more than him. But one who was tempted in all things according to the likeness of your own temptations, yet he was without sin, though. Do you know there's two different types of temptations in the Bible? Now, Jesus was tempted just like you and the most by outside forces. That's one form of temptation. You can't control the outside, but you can control what's inside. That's the other, okay? So Jesus had outside forces like Satan, Pharisees, and so forth tempting him, correct? You had those same temptations, correct? Now here's the difference. Jesus never, never had this type of temptation. Oh, I, I, I'm so tempted to look right now. I, I know it will feel good. Come on, give me strength. Ah. He never had the temptation within him. He had temptations from outside forces. He saw everything that was sin as poison. That's why he never, never sinned. That's why scripture says, put the mind of Christ in you. You know why? Because it can't fail. Christ will never fail in you. So therefore, conclusion, he would never fail. You understand? That's why he's the greatest trailblazer that can be. That's why he could die for us. He was perfect. And he can empathize. He can with our weaknesses. Now, the Father cannot. He never was human. So are you thankful for that? Yes. And the last verse says, therefore, we should come with boldness to the throne of grace. Now, who doesn't come with boldness with grace? The one that's sliding away, slipping away, because they're embarrassed. Correct? And I can probably say we've all been there. Those that live in darkness don't want to see the light. But those in the light want to be with the light. So come with boldness. So if you can't do that, that's a thermometer. Something's off and you must examine yourself. Now it says, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So if you want the mercy of God, you have to be on all cylinders. And what I mean by that is, you can't continue in sin. Who received great mercy in the Old Testament? King David, didn't he? Would he receive that great mercy if he was still up to his mischievous ways? No. You think you can fool God? You can't. God knows what's going on. In fact, you're on his table. It's called the potter's table, isn't it? And everyone is. You know what? I got news for you. The five virgins that were wicked and lazy, they were on the potter's table too. And the potter can't work with that mindset. He gives them time. He's patient. So brethren, let's be the other five virgins. Let's look towards the door, which is Jesus Christ. Prepare, hold fast, endure to the end. When a trial comes, go like Stephen and, and 
Jesus, stand for me, please. I need help. I look towards the kingdom. Stephen was getting killed then. I'm sure your trials, the ones, <laughs> do you trust God? So that's the theme of Hebrews chapter four. Let's endure to the end, brethren.